Friends, Shlomo Phillips coming to you here live from allfaith.com. We are a little bit running late today. I apologize. I was in a meeting with a rabbi and um, got a bit late. I'm going to pull Donald into our conversation. And And got a bit late. I'm going to pull Donald into our conversation. Every time I think we've got this, we're going to be somehow professional. Thing is, uh, Capri. Um, why do we keep playing the? I'm just going to disconnect Donald, and we'll try again once he's at his computer so he can stop that god-awful noise. Uh, Anyway, welcome, friends. I am glad that you're here. Um, Let's try Donald again and see if he can do it with the speakers off without all that noise. There we go. All right. We were getting some horrible noise from you, Donald. That's why I went ahead and uh, shut off the sound there from your computer. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, you're fine. Okay. So I want to welcome everybody to um, to what now. The idea of the show being you made it this far, whatever that means. You've come through your hardships. You've made your decisions for good or bad. What now? That's the topic of this broadcast. And who was telling me I need to be a little bit louder? So let's see if this does it. I'm talking directly into the mic. We're talking straight into it. Um, like I said, I was visiting with the local rabbi today and uh, got back a, just a couple of seconds ago. So I do apologize for that. Um, we have some bad news today concerning... Um, a friend of ours, uh, a very good friend of Donald's. Uh, Donald, I'd like to invite you to share what uh, what is taking place. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I have people working on the house. Uh, Mahal was a dear friend of mine for over 10 years. Died of the flu in January. And... Uh, that really, you know, I didn't know that she had even died until last night. Uh, and I saw the notice on her page when I thought maybe I had said something wrong or I, I didn't know what happened. And uh, then I read that she had passed away. I talked to her. I knew that she had the flu and she was going to the doctor and I hadn't heard from her. And I thought maybe I had offended her, but uh, no, she passed away. Yeah, we we had had a, a few pretty interesting conversations, and I had written back to her a couple of times as well and had not gotten a response, um, but I did not foresee this. This flu this year has been, as we all know, of course, incredibly, incredibly bad. Um, I'd like to welcome um, Cynthia Leora is here. Welcome, Cynthia. I'm glad that you joined us. Guy Brotowski is here. 
Benjamin, Ma Benjamin Mayor Verbrugge is here. Uh, Lisa, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name there, Benjamin. Lisa Eliana Steck is with us. Um, Shlomo has joined us. Dahlia Levy, Levy is here. Shlomo Yisrael and Eduardo Kubilo Sinkovich is here. Ruben Viner is here. Jeanette Zarimba has joined us. Uh, Stephen Baum is here. Jeanette Zarambi says shalom. Zarimbi says shalom. Samuel Astor has joined us. Bawar Kurdi has joined us. And uh, he, uh, Bawar says hello, friends. Hello to you all. As always, I feel sort of uh, obligated to let you know that sometimes um, I don't receive notices properly from Facebook Live when people have joined or when they have commented and Donald doesn't always receive them in a timely proper fashion either so if you make a comment and we mention and we miss your comment um, please um, repost it and let us know because in all likelihood we didn't see it we always respond to the comments that we get um, <clears throat> We don't actually have a set topic for today. Um, like I said, this particular day has just gone not the way that, <laughs> that either Donald or I would have preferred, but for, well, I was going to say for different reasons. I'm actually quite sad to hear about uh, the passing of our friend also. Um, but it's, you know, time is crazy sometimes. And um, we just keep on keeping on. Juan Roca has joined us, as has Tom Doyle, who says, thank you for your time, men. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate that. And Sandra Morell has joined us as well. Um, what I'd like to do to get started today, um, there's a booklet that's put out by Breslov Institute. Um, it's called Have No Fear. And it's based on the teachings of Rabbi Nachman of Breslov and his student, Rabbi Nosen of Breslov. Um, we, purchased, we recently got a series of basically tracks and books that were on sale on Amazon, Breslov material mainly, for a very reasonable price. And most of these I'm not going to really be discussing, but this there's just something about the way that this booklet begins that is just, I don't know, it just really says this so good. So I want to begin by sharing with you from the beginning of Have No Fear, this little booklet. It says, and I think it's actually quite appropriate right now. <clears throat> We live in a climate of gripping fear and encroaching terror, mirroring the, mirroring the underlying global tension that exists in the world today is a sense of dread and fear that leaves us feeling unsettled and anxious. Whether pushing a cart down a we're still on. We should be back now after a very after a momentary glitch. So, whether we're driving to work, sharing a good laugh with a friend, or munching on pizza at the local pizzeria, worried thoughts are continually swimming around in the back of our minds, giving us no peace. How will I pay tuition this month? Is my marriage falling apart? Why is the business so slow this week? Why is my friend back in the hospital getting treatments again? We might add, why has my dear friend just died of the flu? Where can I get help for my child who is failing, who is falling so far behind in school? What will tomorrow bring, or the next day, or the next month, or the next year? How do we cope when anxiety and fear eats away at us from within? The answer is that there is nothing more invincible in the world than Imuna than active faith and trust. When a person's immuna or active faith and trust in God is strong, the person has no fear. As it is written, I will trust you and not be afraid. Yeshayahu 12.2 If you have crystal clear faith in the Almighty and your trust in Him is complete and unyielding, then nothing 
but nothing will frighten you. But let's be realistic. How many of us are really holding on to this high level? In our highly neurotic society, anxiety disorders are prevalent. The psychiatrist's couches are filled. New drugs promising relief keep flooding the market. The daily battles with depression and anxiety has taken its collective toll on our nerves and has transformed us into angry and irritable people. And yet, we remain stubbornly blind to the missing ingredient of our lives, lying at the very heart of all of our fears, which is faith in God. Imuna. When you have faith in God, then there is nothing to fear except God. Life is not random and nothing is arbitrary. Every occurrence, event, and happenstance in your life, whether large or small, is controlled solely by God. As the sages say at Hulim 7b, a person does not stub his finger if it was not decreed from above. Just imagine that for a moment. A person does not stub his finger, does not stub his toe, if it was not decreed from above. God's control over all circumstances in your life is so far-reaching that you can't scratch your pinky finger without it being decreed by heaven. So why do we have all this apprehension and fear? Why not try looking at the situation from a different angle? For instance, let's say that you decided to open a fruit store on the avenue. You take all of your savings and invest it in this one enterprise, hoping that it will succeed and that it will yield profitable returns. Suddenly, another fruit store opens right across the street, and you become alarmed and panicked that your business will be ruined. You spend sleepless nights worrying that all of your savings are going to go down the drain. Now, what would happen if you would replace this fear-based thinking with faith-affirming thoughts? Think about that. If everything truly is in God's hands anyway, and if he determines every outcome, then why be afraid? The next time something frightens you, don't panic. Just remind yourself who's behind it all. You will be surprised to find how calm and reassured you will feel knowing that no one can harm you without God's consent. As it is written, by your name they will call you, and to your place will they seat you. A person cannot touch that which is reserved for his friend. And likewise, one kingdom does not overlap the other, but even by a hair's breadth. This is from the Talmud at Yoma 38a. So, whatever is decided by heaven, that's what it's going to be. And no one will change it otherwise. So, work on it. Make a conscious effort to replace fear with faith. And when you do, you'll find you won't be afraid anymore. Quote, but God is invisible. How can I have faith when I can't even see him, you might wonder. To live with a clear and pure faith, to be consciously aware of God's presence and active involvement in your life at every moment requires the mentoring of a tzaddik. As Rabbi Nachman stated, it is impossible to arrive at faith without a close connection to a tzaddik, because only he can inculcate faith in a person. Likate Maharan, Volume 1, Chapter 7. Furthermore, Rabbi Nachman says that a person must request exceedingly from the Holy One, blessed be he, that he should be worthy of drawing close to a true Sadiq. Look at Maharan, Volume 2, Chapter 78. But, unfortunately today, 
Despite the, under, the underlying yearning of the masses of the Jewish people for that missing something in their lives, the trend of modern thinking does not lend itself in the direction of faith, nor belief in a true Sadiq. Oh, how our generation is suffering because of our lack of faith. Rabbi Nachman says, Alikate Maharan, Volume 1, Chapter 60, that it takes a Sadiq, it takes a righteous person, to arouse another from his slumber, because a person sleeps, and he is not even aware that he is sleeping. Although consciously awake, his mind is in a deep slumber, so he cannot perceive God, which is what destroys him completely. The absence of awareness of God is what causes him to be anxious, and what fills him with utmost dread, to the point that he cannot, <clears throat> to the point that he can become even afraid of his own shadow. The mere association of a person with a true sadic, however, can arouse you from your spiritual slumber, and can reignite that spark of faith from within, until it shines clear and bright. Struck by a sudden awareness that you are standing in the presence of God, you will begin to reach out to Him with your mouth. This is called the action part of faith, pouring out your heart to God in prayer, which serves to strengthen and reinforce your bond with Him. My friend, the formula really is simple. When you have faith, you will have no fear. But, this is something that you must work on very hard. As Rabbi Nachman commented regarding the obstacles to achieving complete faith in God, the sin of a person instills within him denial of God. The sin of a person instills within him denial of God. Sefer Hamidas Sit Faith, paragraph 22. The very act of transgressing God's will implies a denial of his supervision and control, which can then make life at once both arbitrary and frightening. But if you believe in God, truly believe in God, then you will trust that your fate is completely in his hands. As the sages stated at Menachas 39b, Whoever places their trust in the Holy One, blessed be he, will have a refuge in this world and in the world to come. Meaning that when you rely only on God, you are afforded protection in this world and in the next. Don't take this matter lightly. Without faith, a person could never survive life's inevitable ups and downs. The doctor delivers the dreaded diagnosis. Who are you going to turn to now? You cannot get along with your spouse, so your marriage is toppling. Who is going to save the marriage? Your children are sliding into deviancy. Who is going to guide you in helping them? Your relatives, friends, neighbors, and even perfect strangers are meddling in your business, and they're only criticizing and complaining you about you. Where can you hide? Feeling so broken and crushed, and with no one to turn to, you become withdrawn and depressed. Does this sound familiar to anybody out there? Now, imagine how your life can be if you would greet its ordeals and challenges with rock-solid faith in the Almighty God. The minute, the second you feel the slightest pinch in your life, you turn to Him, you pour out your heart's troubles to Him. If you know God's address, then you'll never be lost in your life. And it doesn't stop there. Imuna safeguards you even in the next world. If a person fortified himself with faith, Imuna, in this world, and made himself consciously aware of God down here, then... When his time comes to leave behind the physical world and to enter the purely spiritual world, he will find the surroundings will already be familiar to him. He will not suffer confusion, 
disorientation or apprehension typical of those who failed to live a meaningfully connected life to God. But we say, I have bills to pay, and I am too tired and worn out from work. The stress is getting to me. Worrying about how to afford buying a nice house, buying nice clothing, satisfying my spiritual urges. To start worrying now about my relationship with God, that's too much. And after all of the sins that I've committed, who says God now wants me anyway? Even with all of these excuses, I'd never, it's never too late for you, nor are you ever too far gone to start working on your imuna. Recall what Rebbe Nachman said. By having faith, the Holy One, blessed be He, will forgive you and all of your sins. Sefer Hamidos, Sit Imuna, paragraph 33. Furthermore, however, what the prophet said, She will seek faith, then I will forgive her. Jeremiah, chapter 5, verse 1. Faith is the yardstick by which God measures our allegiance to Him. It is therefore paramount. And yet, you can never say enough, nor can you finish speaking to others about this slippery concept of faith that continues to elude mankind, blinded by the elusive nature of our world. And as long as God's presence remains disguised or concealed, and the message of faith is muted by a disbelieving society, mankind, men and women, will be plagued by mortal fear and by terror. Thus, the rustling of the leaf and the fleeting shadow will continue to make them jump with fright as anxiety insinuates its way into his psyche. As Rabbi Nachman warned, warned, fear saps the strength of a person. Sefer Hamidos cite fear, paragraph 8. Fear can literally make a person sick because fear breeds more fear. Fear preys on the imagination, inducing paranoid thinking where you may suddenly develop a fear of, let's say, being sued or a fear of having a skirmish with the law and of being thrown into jail. Or it may develop into a complex, taking the form of social inhibition such as being too shy around your neighbors, or being easily intimidated by other people. Or it may take the guise of a common fear such as that of dogs, and so on. But when your faith in God is firm, then you have no fear. On a deeper level, recognizing that at the core, all fear lies in in a well of guilt. Rebbe Nachman recommended that a person should accustom himself to making a self-evaluation before the Holy One, blessed be he, by offering a daily accounting of his deeds. From Likate Maharan, Volume 1, Chapter 15. This is, by the way, what we refer to as Hit Bodhidut, and we discuss pretty often. Elaborating even further, the sages said, when there is justice executed down here in the earthly realm, then there is no need for justice to be served from above. In other words, if we judge ourselves, the heavenly court has no need to judge us. This is from Devarim Rabbah, chapter 5, paragraph 5. So, isn't it time to start living a guilt-free life? Why not do some soul-searching every day? <clears throat> and unload some of the guilt that is weighing you down. Feeling closer to God, <clears throat> excuse me, would you mind give me some water? Feeling closer to God, you'll feel better about yourself, and then life will seem more fun than it does intimidating. That's the first section of this book, Have No Fear, which is produced by the... Um, um, the Breslov Institute. They don't give a particular writer's name on it. It's just by Breslov Institute.
Uh, so I th- hang on just a second, Don. Let me finish this. So I think this would be a really interesting topic for us to discuss today. What is fear? How does it get into our souls? And more importantly, how can we rid ourselves of fear? Donald? Hold on just a second. I've got people working on the house, and that's what all the banging is in the background. Oh, that's okay. Just keep your mic muted. We weren't hearing anything. Right. That's why I was trying to avoid that. But I did want to say I, I think that uh, I like that book, and I would like to see us maybe read that uh, if it's acceptable. Uh, may have copyright. I don't know. Well, like I said, but, we've already. I just read about half of it. It's just a little track. Oh, it is wonderful. Yeah. Anyway, I think we know what you know. You and I've discussed fear, which means false evidence appearing real. Right. And it can give us a lot of anxiety. So if it's false I'm evidence, use the mic again while they're working here. Okay, thank you, Donald. So if it's if it's false evidence appearing real, and I like that. Um, uh, analogy or that there's a word for that but uh, I like that so if that's the case <clears throat> false evidence what is the false evidence the false evidence says that everything is up to me or it says everything is up to those people who don't like me who are hurting me who are attacking me that's false evidence because the true evidence is that Hashem is with his people. That is the true evidence. Uh, I want to welcome a few more people who have joined us. I think I'm starting at the right place. If not, you're welcome, so I'll welcome you again. But I want to welcome Sandra Morell. Uh, Gina Bowman has joined us. Uh, Of course, Ahuva. Um, Anthony Carey has joined us. Carol Brady Renaud says that I'm looking good. Well, thank you, Carol. Um, hope you're feeling better, by the way. I know you were feeling a little bit under the weather, uh, or quite a bit under the weather. Lily uh, Coopers has joined us. Bill Shook has joined us. Suzanne Hamlin is here. Um, Shlomo is here. I think I already said hi to you. I think you must have gone out and come back. Oh, no, that's not Shlomo. That's uh, uh, Shal- Shlomo. Welcome. I'm glad that you're here. Probably mispronouncing your name. Uh, Donald says he's listening. Uh, Donald says, welcome to Jeanette and Zarimba, and welcome. I just realized that we have 211 mutual friends. David Spear has joined us. Yaakov Uriel has joined us. Tom Doyle says yes. Sandra Morell says, regret, have to leave for a while, but thanks for blessings. Thank you, Sandra. Hopefully you can come back. Um, and uh, let's see. Uh, Farad is here, Ben Avraham is here, Maureen Howe is here, Veronica joined us, Tom Doyle is here, Veronica Port says Shalom, and Andre Rivnell is here as well. I am truly glad that you're all joining us and that you're all here with us. Um, So, you know, I was watching the news. So remember, the name of the show is What Now, right? We got to this point, What Now? This name of this show, the focus of this show, does lend itself also to world events. Because world events are part of what is happening right now. So while this is not a political show, we can entertain some limited discussion on politics, I think, properly in the context of this. Um, I don't want to get partisan, however. That's, we want to avoid that. But I was watching the news, and... Um, And I noticed something that I thought was really sort of interesting. Kim Jong-un has decided that maybe he could work with the West. And he has promised that he will not attack uh, South Korea for a certain period that seems sort of uncertain. And that he will even consider doing away with his nukes. That's pretty impressive. That's a pretty major thing to have happening right now. When that section of the news ended, then the talking heads start up. And the first thing the talking heads said was, can we trust him? Is this real? No, no. He's just setting us up so that he can finish his nuclear development, his nuclear program, which might be true. Not knocking the idea. But the first thing that comes to mind, typically, seems to be fear. 
Okay, Donald, thank you for being here. I know you got a lot going on there. Thank you, Donald, and uh, we'll talk to you uh, tomorrow, hopefully, at, at, for the noon broadcast. Have a great day. Um, so the first thing that comes to mind, though, is fear. It's like, well, I'm afraid that Kim Jong-un is not going to do what he said, or I'm afraid that this probe is going to develop something, or I'm afraid that this is going to happen or that's going to happen. <clears throat> we have so much fear. It's a natural part of our lives. We live with fear. Because we're living with fear, we live with uncertainties. We live with this inner stress, this inner tension. And because we have to pay our bills, we live with the fear. What if I can't do that? What if I lose my job? What if I lose my insurance? What if the tariffs that President Trump is introducing end up hurting the economy and I'm just barely getting by as it is? Our lives are filled with fear. Some fears are justified, but that doesn't change the effect that they have on our consciousness, on our soul, on our hearts, on our health. Stress is stress. And stress is a killer. <clears throat> I've read that all things considered, stress is probably the number one killer. We understand that. And stress can come from many, many, many different sources. How living in such a stressful world, living in a world where there are literally people who would like nothing more than to kill us, and we know this is true, whether you agree with whoever or not, we all know that's true. And you don't have to be Jewish, by the way, to face people who would love to see you dead these days. <clears throat> How do you live in such a world of uncertainty where everything is constantly changing? Remember the old book Future Shock? Back from the, what was it, the 60s, I think, maybe 70s. But Future Shock discussed the idea of a world that was changing so quickly that we could not mentally cope. It was leaving us behind. I was born 60 some odd years ago back in the Old South. I live in Tennessee again now, Chattanooga, North Georgia. I grew up in North Atlanta. But back then, it was a radically different world. I mean, radically different world. There was no Internet. There was no way to talk to people all around the world. There was really no way of knowing what was going on except you watch Walter Cronkite for 15 minutes of news. And then later we find out that Walter Cronkite was a globalist who, who was working for the destruction of America. Go figure. But we thought we had a good bead on life. We knew what was right and what was wrong. We knew people did what was wrong, but they knew that what they were doing was wrong. Everything was black and white back then for a lot of us. We knew that God exists. We knew. We, maybe we weren't quite sure who God was, but we knew there was a God. We knew there was a creator. We knew that the good always win in the end. We knew that the good guys wore white hats and the bad guys wore black hats. It was on all the Westerns we watched. We knew. And we didn't have nearly the degree of stress. And if you got a job back then with a good company, that company pretty much was loyal to you. And you would expect to regularly get a raise and and you would stay with the same. My dad worked for General Motors and most of his adult life. And General Motors is really good to him. But, th but it's not the same anymore. We don't have the guarantee of protection. Now, just before retirement, companies lay people off my neighbor worked for general electric his whole life and a year before retirement general electric decided to fire him not because he did anything wrong but because they didn't want to have to pay his retirement money um it happened back then but not like it does now we have no sense of security and we're all riddled with anger and anxiety and fear and concern and like donald said fear is the false evidence appearing real why is that false evidence? It's false evidence because we assume that these outward circumstances actually have power. They don't. They do not. If you place your amuna in Hashem, if you place your faith and your trust in Hashem, we are promised by God that He will be the one to chart our course. Now, does this mean that bad things won't happen? Of course not. Our history is filled with bad things happening to good people. And I don't just mean the Jewish history. I mean the history of the world. 
is filled with stories of bad things happening to good people. But with Amuna, a person with faith, with genuine faith, a person like that understands that when bad things come into my life, I'm not alone. We understand this in different ways. As a Hasid, we would say that every single thing happens by the will of God. In other words, you lost your job by the will of God. You contracted this illness by the will of God. You became homeless by the will of God. Now, that seems harsh. But that is the Hasidic understanding because we believe that God is actually actively involved in everything that happens. And when you got that raise, it was because God gave you a raise. And when you moved up into a nicer home, it's because God gave you the nicer home. God gave you the nicer car. God replaced this really bad girlfriend that you had with a wonderful wife. It's all in God's hands. But even if you can't understand or believe that, even if that seems too predeterminism and you just can't buy that, you can at least know that you're not alone and that with God, you can have faith that he is with you and that he will help you through your situation. So when the bad thing happens, you honestly evaluate yourself. Why did this happen to me? What did I do? Did I deserve this? Well, God's not going to do anything to you that you don't deserve. So, yeah, you deserved it. Why did I deserve it? Maybe I need to make some teshuva. Maybe I need to make some repentance in this area of my life. Maybe I was too harsh with people. Maybe I didn't have enough faith in God. Maybe I was selfish. Maybe I was not willing to give charity to people. Maybe I wasn't praying. God will put situations in your life that will cause you to stop and think. That's the purpose of all the seemingly negative things that happen. And this is why as Jews, we tend to say Baruch Hashem for the good things that happen and also for the seemingly bad things to happen because we understand Everything happens by the will of God. And if this seems too far for you to reach, and I understand. I mean, I've had times in my life and I've said, I cannot see God in this. Even if you can't rise or elevate your consciousness to that level, and that's a pretty high level, you can at least have the assurance that you're not alone, that God is with you. And you can turn to God and you can say, God I don't know why this is happening. I don't think I deserve this. I don't think this is fair. I think this is coming out of left field. But it is my reality, and you are here with me, so please help me work through this. And if I need to learn something from this process, please show me, and then pay attention to his answer. The beginning of the reading in Have No Fear was talking about the importance of the true Sadiq. One of the things that distinguishes Hasids from other Jews, whether you're talking Breslov, Chabad, Nicholsburg, Satmar, there's hundreds of Hasidic orders. But all of these Hasidic orders get their origins with a man named the Bel Shem Tov, the best. All of the Hasids refer to the importance of the living Sadiq. The reason for that is we are taught that in every generation, at all times, there are a minimum of 36 to 38 righteous people living on the earth, at least, minimum. These are true Sadiqs. These are people who know God. If that generation warrants it, any one of those people could actually be anointed by Hashem to be the Messiah. But we're not talking about the Messiah in this broadcast. A true Sadiq is a person who sees clearly. Most of the Sadiqs, not all, but most of the true Sadiqs, we're talking someone who is, his Yetzir Tov is like up in the 90 percentiles. His, his, his good impulse, his desire for God is very, very high. Most of the Sadiqs have had a hard life. Most of them can really relate with you and me in our hardships, in our doubts, in our fears. They know because they've been there. And they have worked step by step to overcome those things. And if they can, then we can. A Rebbe Nachman is not born a Rebbe Nachman. A Rebbe Nachman or a you know, Rebbe Schneerson, these people are born as babies. And they grow up. Some of them are in Jewish households. Some of them are converts. But they come to a point in their life where they realize 
I need more. I need imuna. I need active faith and trust in God, and I need to live my life according to that faith. If you can attach yourself to such a person, their faith, their righteousness, their piety will bleed over onto you just as surely as if you hang out with gangbangers, you might not become a gangbanger, but there's a pretty good chance, but you are going to become a person with a lower consciousness level. If you're around people who are constantly cursing, you're going to find curse words coming out of your mouth. If you hang around with drug dealers, you're going to end up doing drugs. It's just a fact. If you hang around with any group of people, that group of people are going to influence you and your decisions. If you hang out with a Sadiq, if you hang out with righteous people, their righteousness is going to influence you. Their righteousness is going to inspire you to become a better person. It is going to inspire you to reach closer and closer and closer for the goal of devahut, attachment to God. It just makes sense. So, when we talk about the importance of attaching oneself to a true sadik, we're not talking about some kind of a mediator between God and man like other religions have. There is no mediator between you and God. It's between you and God. But, by attaching yourself to a righteous person, you will learn. You will see their examples. You will be inspired by them. And they will encourage you either by words or simply by observing their actions, their way of life, to advance your consciousness, to attach yourself more firmly. This presents an obvious problem. How many true sodics are living in Chattanooga, Tennessee, are living in Houston, Texas, are living in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, are living in, you know, backwater Kansas, and I don't mean that in negative towards Kansas. I mean the the small towns across our country. How many true sodics live in these places? Well, there's a story that's told. There was once a man who went to the Bel Shem Tov, and he said to him, "In my town, which is a very small shtetl, I don't know that there's anyone righteous here. I don't think we have any sodics." So the Belsham Tov said, here's what I want you to do. Go door to door. And when people come to the door, ask them if they're Shomer Shabbos, if they observe the Shabbat properly, because that's a good starting point to find out. So the man goes door to door, knocks on the door. Excuse me, are you Shomer Shabbos? Well, no, we're not. Are you? Well, sort of, you know, we're not perfect, but sort of. And he goes throughout the whole, oh, I don't care about Shabbat. Talks to everybody in the town, comes back to the Belsham Tov. Belsham Tov asks him what the results were. And he says, well, Nobody in town told me that they were 100% Shomer Shabbos. And so the Bel Shem Tov said, ah, so are any of the people Sadiqs? And he says, not as far as I can tell. And the Bel Shem Tov said, wonderful. That means you get to be the Sadiq. And therefore, when people come to your door, you can say, yes, I am Shomer Shabbos. Just because other people aren't doing it doesn't mean you can't do it. How can you do it? by the wisdom and the association of someone like the Bel Shem Tov. All of us have the ability to draw closer to God. By studying the teachings of Rebbe Nachman of Breslov, by studying the teachings of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, by studying the teachings of the Rebbe of Nicholsburg, by studying the teachings of Rambam, of Rashi, of the sages, of Rebbe Natan, of the, the current living rabbis, people like Rav Dror, people like Rav Shalom Arush, by looking at the examples of these sadiks, you will find yourself elevated. But a, word of, but a word of warning here. You may have heard of a very famous Russian philosopher named Gurdjieff. Back in the day, I, I studied a lot of Gurdjieff. One of Gurdjieff's lines that I thought was very, very insightful, he, Gurdjieff was a Eastern Christian, Eastern Orthodox Christian, and he said that if you want to make a person an atheist, the best way to do it is to have him make friends with a priest. 
And I just thought that was one of the most insightful statements I'd ever read. If you begin looking at people that you believe are sadikim, you believe these are righteous people. These are people who are doing it right. And I can go with these people. Do not put them on a pedestal. Because I'm telling you, they will not stay there. We are all human beings. How many times online do you meet a friend, you make a new Facebook friend, and you're meeting in conversations, you're chatting in the chat rooms, you're, you're texting in the comments, and you're thinking, oh, this guy's got, got a good beat. I like this person. And then all of a sudden, something comes out of their mouth, and you're just like, whoa, where did that come from? I thought you were smart. Something really interesting you may notice. If you already have a good feeling towards that person, <clears throat> you're probably going to say, well, that's their perspective. I can understand that. But if you already have a negative feeling towards that person, oh, I knew they were like that. They're, you know, We all do it. We make an assumption. Don't put people on a pedestal. Because I'm telling you, virtually all of them will demonstrate to you that they have feet of clay. Even Rebbe Nachman of Breslov, one of the most righteous, pious, holy people who ever lived, one of the most attached to God individuals that ever lived, when Rebbe Nachman was dying at a very early age, he was very sick and he was dying, very, very young, his disciples went to Uman to gather around and to, because they were afraid this might be his last Rosh Hashanah. And so they were there and they were with him and they began praising him. Oh, the greatest of all rabbis, the wisest of all rabbis. I'm not, by the way, I'm not saying, I'm not comparing him. But they were saying, you are the greatest rabbi of all times. You have been such a blessing. And they're just praising him to the high heavens. Rebbe Nachman, laying there dying, holds up his hand and said, wait, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Right now, I'm just an old man dying. I'm not a sodic right now. I'm just an old man dying. We are all human beings. Don't put anybody on a pedestal because there's none righteous but Hashem. Having said that, attach yourself to people who are more righteous, to people who are more Torah observant, to people who are more inspirational to you. And if you'll do this, you'll find that you will become more Torah observant more understanding of the scriptures, more righteous, more loving, more gentile, uh, gen gentile, gen more gentle, more loving and more kind and so on. But don't put them on a pedestal because I'm telling you that never works. Um, Susan Randall's joined us a couple minutes ago and said that my friend Shlomo Silverman are with, is there too. They're both very wonderful people. Uh, actually, the Shlomo was outside uh, moving lots of snow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I guess Slomo Silverman's not with us right now, but Susan is. I'm glad that you're here always. They have a really interesting, they live, I don't want to get, tell too much about you, but they're up in the great white north, so to speak, and have a really interesting life and stuff. Wonderful friends from the House of Seven Beggars. Uh, Carol St. George says, howdy. Um, Louise Enrique Fries Padua has joined us. Fabre Abru Abru has joined us. Nathaniel Gartrell has joined us. Uh, and he says, or living in my town, yeah. Uh, Susan says, I have experienced many, many instances on the farm that could have turned out to be incredibly nasty, dangerous, injurious to people or other animals and property that turned out well, mainly by asking Hashem for assistance and the assistance by some unexpected sources. Absolutely. Uh, Susan Sizemore, welcome. Glad that you're here. And this really is the point. We used to have this thing, you know, is the cup half full or half empty? Well, luckily this one's full. I forgot who brought it to me. Wet my whistle a little bit. But we used to say, is the glass half full or half empty? A pessimist says it's half empty. An optimist says it's half full. I always thought that was a really bad combination. What you want is you want a glass that's closer to full. Yeah, but... You want to also be honest about where the glass is. You don't want to pretend like it's half full or half empty. You want to say, it's a glass of water and it's going to satisfy my thirst. And that really is my point. 
Attach yourself to good, pure, clean water. Seems common sense if you're talking about drinking it, right? But a lot of times we drink dirty, putrid water. And when we do, what happens? We don't feel good. We feel sick. So we always get, um, we have a big bottle in there. We go to the store and we, we pick up filtered water, because our spring water, because we want pure water. Uh, we don't trust the water from the taps too much as far as drinking it goes because it's got a lot of chlorine and other stuff in it. You want to drink clean water. In the same way, you want to keep your consciousness clean. How do you do that? You keep your consciousness clean by being very selective about your associations. Hang out with dirty people and become dirty. Hang out with clean people and become clean. The word kosher only really applies to food, but it's been sort of usurped and it's used for pretty much anything. Because what the word kosher actually means is it means fit. Something is fit. Something is clean. Something is worthy of using. It's kosher. Like Again, we mainly use that for talking about food and kashrut. But, but you'll also hear people say it's a kosher holiday. It's a kosher website. It's not an accurate use of the term technically, but it is nonetheless true. Um, you want to have a kosher life. You want to have kosher friends, friends who are fit, friends who are positive in your life, who are encouraging you. That is very, very important. If you have such friends, if you have such a consciousness, you will have no fear because you'll be growing in your trust of Hashem and you'll be seeing that Hashem is active. In the Noahide uh, group, One God, Seven Laws, uh, a couple of days ago, I got a question that said that the Jews saw the presence of Hashem at Mount Sinai, so they knew God was there. But how about the Gentiles? Well, in our life, whether we're Jewish or not, I have not seen Hashem appearing in my life. I mean, a, they did at Mount Sinai. Um, Hashem will prove himself to you, Jew or Gentile. He will prove himself. He will, he will manifest himself to you in a sense, in your consciousness. And this is how you get to that point. As we read here a moment ago, faith is how God determines a person's situation. Shalom Rush says that no bad comes without a transgression. So that if you have a bad thing happens, it means that Hashem is trying to help you through a transgression. Susan says that Shlomo has come in now and he's listening in the background. Hi, Shlomo. Glad you're, glad you're here listening. Hope you got your sound system fixed up. I know you're having a problem with that last night. Um, but this really is the secret. It's not, my sister used to always say, it's not about the sign over the door. It's about what happens inside the building. Um, it's not about what you call yourself. It's about your consciousness. If you have Hashem in your life, then there's no need to have fear. I'm going to continue reading on this book by Breslov Research Institute, Have No Fear. If you happen to have this little track, it really is a great little booklet. I'm on page 11. I want to read a little bit more of, to, uh, of this to you. Our society is filled with a lot of sad people who are depressed and who don't even realize it. True. People are shopping and buying houses and cars and going on vacations, but deep down, they genuinely are not happy. Religion may have answers, but in our rational-minded culture, where we feel distant from God, religious concepts are generally dismissed as outdated. Imagine informing a person raised with Western values that with each sin committed, he creates an evil husk. And destructive forces, undoubtedly, he will shoot back at you and laugh. Today, we have no such thoughts as demons and spirits, etc. In fact, society at large would, be, would unanimously agree that we don't believe in such things anymore. And there never were, and there never will be, any such phenomenon. Because now, we can explain everything by the great God, science. And yet, examining the matter more closely, how else can we account for the various strange and bizarre behavioral phenomenons 
that we observe today. Haven't you ever witnessed someone just fly off the handle in an abrupt and sudden rage for no apparent reason? I certainly have. What about the once vivacious and merry socialite who out of nowhere suddenly becomes sullen and depressed, withdrawing completely from the company of others? I might add, how about some of these comedians, very, very famous comedians who made the world laugh and suddenly they just become these absolutely horribly miserable people who are sad and who have no point in life and who are miserable. It seems like all of a sudden, continuing, drawing from their wisdom of the ages, the sages inform us that, quote, there is a demon that is called Ketev Marit that is responsible for making a person's life bitter. This according to Ica Rabba, chapter 129, to Humanasa, chapter 23 as well. Believe it or not, there are demonic forces and spirits in the world, even today. They are derived from one's own promiscuous behaviors, lustful thoughts, and fantasies. Or they come from eating non-kosher foods that induce depression unsuspectingly. How else could you explain how a once popular boy who had friends and an active social life now suddenly becomes withdrawn, feels uncomfortable being around people, and even hesitates to venture outside of his house, and he stops relating to the world completely without any explanation. This describes the condition now, but what about the cure? Rabbi Nachman informs us that by performing the divine commandments, the mitzvot, with joy, we can repair the emotional and psychological ravages of our sinful behaviors. Look at Maharan chapter 124, chapter 1, paragraph 24. The very act of fulfilling a mitzvah, a divine commandment with joy, completes the circuit connecting a person to God and illuminates him with the insight that there is more meaning to his existence than the mere satisfaction of earthly desires. Over time, as this joy intensifies, it only serves to reinforce the bond of intimacy, leading to an ever greater desire for pleasure derived from being close to God. Finding the relationship so profoundly satisfying, you become free from the inexorable grip of unhealthy wants and needs as they become subordinate to the passionate yearning for God. The sheer joy of being enraptured by the mitzvot has the power to literally lift you up off of your feet and to transcend the limiting factors of the external world, sweeping out these demons, so to speak, that lie at the heart of all neuroses. Thus, the fears and frustrations that were born out of the former Cold War conflicts with the will of the Creator dissolves into the warmth generated by joy found in fulfilling His commandments. Furthermore, Rebbe Nachman added that whenever a person performs a mitzvah, a commandment, with joy, it indicates that his heart is whole with his God. Sefer Hamidosh, Chapter Joy, Paragraph 1. It's axiomatic that when you are happy, you do not fear. To be sure, we live in an uptight society, and being happy does not come easy for many of us. Therefore, you must make that extra effort to achieve happiness. As Rabbi Nachman said, when a person is always happy, the Holy One, blessed be He, guards him from immorality and from all other indiscretions. So esteemed is joy in the eyes of God. Ligate Maharan, Volume 1, Paragraph 169. Moreover, Rabbi Nachman stressed that it's a great mitzvah to be always happy. Ligate Maharan, 2.24. In the cold world that we live in today, this is not as simple as it sounds. Nonetheless, you must surf against the tide of popular thinking. You must force joy, and you must simply be happy for happiness' sake, because it's the one divine commandment that surpasses all others. Joy 
is the clearest expression of a sincere desire on the part of the Jew to reform by undoing the damage incurred by the mistakes of his past and by escaping its devastating consequences now and in the future. Indeed, we are all aware that the sinner is relentlessly pursued by his worries, as expressed by the verse, I shall worry because of my sins, to Helam 38.19. The guilt-laden sins of a person fill him with dread, which in turn makes him more fearful. As Rabbi Nachman said, through worry comes fear. Sefer Hamidos, chapter heading, Fear, paragraph 36. So think about it. Why are people today so plagued by irrational fear and free-floating anxiety? The answer is that a person is responding to a sense of alienation from God. As Rabbi Nachman said, Whoever has fear, it indicates that the Holy One, blessed be He, has hidden His face from Him, and that harsh judgments have been leveled against Him. The person, on the other hand, who firmly believes that God is with him, right by his side, to the extent that he perceives all of his natural senses, godliness in everything around him, does not know the meaning of fear. Because there is no greater joy in this world than to sense intima intimations of the divine from behind the guise of nature. In other words, there's no greater joy in the world than looking at the world around us and seeing God's presence manifested therein. Rabbi Nachman warned, however, through worry and fear, the heart becomes clogged and incapable of experiencing God. This leads to anxiety and destroys life. Sefer Hamidos, chapter Fear, paragraph 31. And yet, with the statistics revealing an uncommonly high incident rate of neurotic disorders, and with more and more people seeking psychological and psychiatric services, we still fail to make the connection between our internal fears and our estrangement from God. We may spend many, many therapeutic hours on the couch and never come an inch closer to, heart, to the heart of our problem unless we turn to the tzaddik. The tzaddik can teach you and reveal to you. The tzaddik has the power to tenderize the most stubborn of hearts and to make it sensitive to the value of performing the mitzvot with utmost joy. The tzaddik unlocks the hidden potential and brings out the best within us always helping us to appreciate the unique privilege that we have in fulfilling God's will every day. After all, did not the sages teach us that even the illiterate from among you is filled with mitzvot like the seeds in a pomegranate? Barakos 57a. And he has much work to do. Many of us today can benefit from this healing message. Did not the prophet Yeshayahu complain that even in his time, the performance of the commandments were like rote learning of human commands? Yeshayahu 29, 13. Before doing a mitzvah, take a moment to recognize that you're actually performing the will of God. You may feel a sudden surge of joy, or you may be tickled with happiness. As the sages said at Vayikra Rabbah chapter 34, paragraph 9, the Torah taught us the proper protocol. When a person performs a mitzvah, he should do so with a glad heart. Yes, by wrapping yourself in tzitzit, by crowning yourself with tefillin, by kissing the mezuzah as you pass through the doorway, or just as you're entering a synagogue to pray, you are doing what God wants you to do. Could there ever be a greater joy than that? Is this not the ultimate purpose of our existence? As a Jew, you have the privilege of giving charity to a fellow Jew or of performing an act of kindness for another Jew. What other legacy will remain after you're gone, if not this? 
An observant Jew eats only kosher food. This is what will remain. A Jew keeps his head covered and retains his beard and his side curls, his pais. This is what will remain. A Jewish woman conducts herself modestly by covering her head. This is what remain after her. And a Jew keeps the Shabbat. This will stand before him. As the sages say at Sota 3b, anyone who performs a commandment in this world, it will precede him, and it will walk before him into the world to come. Now for my Noahide friends, I want to point out, this applies to you as well. If you will keep the seven laws with love and joy, that is what will precede you into the world to come. So this message isn't only for Jews. So now imagine, if we are all filled with mitzvot like the seeds of a pomegranate, then where is there room for sadness and depression? Open up your eyes and kick up your heels out of sheer joy that you are so wonderfully privileged. Banish fear from your heart by just getting happy, just by virtue of the fact of your happiness, happiness in itself will wipe away all of your fears. Fear only signifies that you are very far from God, and that you are very far, and that you are very much affected by the external factors of life which are ruining you. As the sages say at Davarim Rabbah chapter 5, Whoever trusts in the Holy One, blessed be he, is worthy of being like him. However, whoever trusts in idols is condemned to become like them. Simply put, if a person works out his trust in God by maintaining a positive outlook and is buoyantly optimistic because he feels so connected to God, then what is there to be afraid of in this life? Who can possibly harm such a person? How lucky is this person? Moreover, every moment that his mind is turned to God, he is fulfilling the positive command of clinging to God. On the other hand, when a person turns his back on God, it is equated with serving idols, as it is written at Devarim chapter 11, 16, and they will turn and serve other gods. To which the Bel Shem Tov elaborated that the minute a person just turns aside from God, it's as though he were already worshiping idols. So, stop living your life out of terror. Break out in joy and song and shake off all of those phobias and fears. As Rabbi Nachman said at Sefer Hamidosh chapter fear, paragraph 11, whoever has anxiety should hum a happy little tune. Try it. It works like magic. Have no fear. The next time you feel nervous and anxious, just whisper a happy little tune. As happiness wells up inside of you, so will your confidence level and your trust in God that life really is not so bad after all. I've discussed here before the, um, the Patek, the note that was revealed to Saba Yisrael. Saba is a, uh, was a great Breslover, uh, a follower of Rebbe Nachman of Breslov. And he received a most fascinating note, which I've talked about before. I'm not going to go into too much detail about it now, but I am going to post a link to the Patek, uh, to a study that I did on the Patek, if you're interested. But the essence that we got out of the Patek was a happy little ditty. That happy little ditty is Na Nak Nakma Nakman Meoman. It is thanking Hashem for the Sadik Nanak, who is Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. So when you're feeling depressed, when you're feeling frightened, when you're feeling anxious, something just isn't right. You don't know what it is, but something just isn't right. You can just simply go, Na nak nak man nak man me o man na nak nak man nak man me o man. It's thanking Hashem for sending us Rebbe Nachman of Uman, who is Rebbe Nachman of Breslov. 
Nanak Nakman Nakman Mayuman. The link I just sent will tell you about the Patek and the letter from heaven that began this movement. There is a Breslov sect who are called the Nanaks, who are the ones who are really publicizing this name. You don't have to be a Nanak, however, to appreciate the power of this, because through the Nanak Nakman Nakman Mayuman, the Song of Universal Redemption, as it's called, you will attach yourself to the Sadiq. You'll attach yourself to Rebbe Nachman of Breslov. It's a very powerful cure. Try it. See if it doesn't work. Na, nak, nakma, nakman, meoman. Um, it really, really does have great power. I'll post it for you here uh, in just a second um, so that you can see the writing on it. Uh, when you translate it into English, of course, as all these things, it's uh, written in various ways. But uh, this is na nak nakma nakman meoman. Uh, it's based on a prophecy that was given by the Bel Shem Tov. And Rabbi Nachman mentioned it. It's actually a very ancient prophecy that says that um, that the time will come when God will reveal a certain name, a certain sound, and the belief by many of these Breslavers is that this name is found in, um, is found in this phrase, Nanak, Nakman, Nakman, Neumann. Um, so anyway, you can check that out more if you want to. But the point right now, though, is really, when things go bad, a little tune. Rabbi Nachman said, it's a great mitzvah to be happy always. If you're not happy, do something, even if it's silly, even if it's something that looks odd, a little dance for no reason, a little happiness for no reason, a joke. Donald's great at telling us jokes to keep us our spirits alivened. Um, just be happy. And you should be happy. I should be happy all the time. If I truly believe in God, if I truly believe that Hashem is watching over my every aspect of my life, I shouldn't be stressed out. I get stressed out. I'm not going to lie to you. I shouldn't get stressed out. I should just say, Nanak, Nakma, Nakma, Mayoman, or Mary had a little lamb, or whatever, but something that's going to make you happy, something that's going to make you smile. Carol says, Can we be happy even when things are not going well? We also leave footsteps which others see, so we must follow Hashem close to leave good footprints. Life is so. Life is good even when it seems bad. Well, yeah, and this is actually the um, this is actually the point, Carol. Um, if you truly believe, if I truly believe that God is leading me, that God is intimately involved in my life, and that nothing bad happens to me, that everything that happens to me is giving me the opportunity to draw closer to God. If I really believe that, how can I not be happy? And so when bad things happen, I say, Baruch Hashem, thank you, God. You just gave me another opportunity to grow. The fact that God is teaching you means that God is there with you and that God loves you and that God wants you to get better. Otherwise, he'd say, you know what? I don't care. Just do your thing. We'd have deism. Do your thing. I don't care. Doesn't matter. We often look at some of these really rich people who are really very ungodly people, and we think nothing bad ever happens to these people. They've got everything. And we sometimes think, well, I wish I was them. No, you don't. God's given up on some of those people. That's why nothing bad ever happens to them. God has said, you know what? Enjoy it while well, you got it because you ain't going to have it in the future. They won't listen. And this is why so many of the great, um, this is why so many of the great sa uh, sages and Sadiqim have gone through some unbelievably hard life experiences. Because God was training them, because God was teaching them, because God was paying attention in their lives and put things in their path that would make them turn to him, that would inspire them, encourage them, and lead them to making the tikkun that they needed to make, the, the, the reparations for their soul that they needed to make. If we truly believe this, there is honestly no reason to have any fear, any doubt, any negativity. 
We would never need to say, God, you're not being fair to me because you would know. Of course, God's being fair to you. That's hard. Living in our world. That's real hard. I mean, <laughs> believe me, I know. And I, I blow it all the time. It's, this is very, very, this is tough stuff. It sounds easy to say it. This is tough stuff. Susan Randall said, um, oh, this is, okay, well, this is Shlomo. Shlomo says on Susan's account, uh, but, um, but the, my thing jumped here. Like Shlomo's cancer diagnosis, it was a blessing. Our friend Shlomo, uh, just, it was, he had a cancer uh, situation, and he's, he's working through it, and it's, it's inspired him to make his life better. It's inspired him to turn some stuff around. If we have the intelligence to realize all of these negative things are God working in our lives, and it's perfectly rational to think that, why wouldn't we be happy? Nobody wants cancer. Nobody wants to lose their job. Nobody wants to go on welfare. Nobody wants to get sick. Nobody wants their loved ones to pass away or whatever. But if we can just understand that all of these things work for the ultimate good of the individual as well as for the society as a whole, our worlds will be, our lives, our worldview will be radically transformed. I'm not saying it's easy, but it is something to work towards. Susan says, for more than 20 years, I have had the happy tune habit somewhere over the rainbow, like Brother Israel Kamalka. Yeah. Um, it's powerful. Just humming. You know, I like the flute. I don't, I'm trying to sort of figure out how to play some songs on it, but actually Native American flutes, you don't play songs. You let the flute play itself, which is one reason why I love the Native American flute so much. You just make a tune. You just let your, your soul speak in the language of a tune. And it can be incredibly powerful. Carrie Hollis has joined us again. I guess you probably kicked off. I think you were already here, but I'm glad that you're here regardless. Um, it's like Shlomo's Cancer is a blessing. Shane, uh, Shane Alia has joined us. Uh, welcome. So this really is the point here with this book is uh, this little booklet. Find the happiness. Find the joy. And if you don't feel happiness, do something silly. Make yourself happy. Sing a little tune. Carrie says, here they have women's retreats with natural drums. Yeah, it's a similar kind of thing, all these drum circles. I've talked to, um, I used to play, um, I used to play Murdunga a little bit. It's an Indian drum. But I've talked to a lot of these people who do these drum circles. And in most of the cases that I've talked to the drum, I mean, I'm including some incredibly good drummers. What they tell you is that at first, yeah, you're just trying to get a tune that works and everybody has to be in sync or it doesn't sound good. But pretty soon you transform your consciousness into those sounds. You become the sounds and you don't play the drums anymore. The drums play you. Same with the Indian flute. You don't play the Indian flute if you're doing it right. The Indian flute or Cherokee flute plays you. You're simply giving it the power to express its own self. Now, don't take that too far. Literally, of course. But we need to get the stress out of us. We need to get the fear out of us. We need to get the frustrations out of us. One way to do that is with the natural drums at these women's retreats, is with the, uh, with the, uh, the Cherokee flute. I always forget things are backwards than what they look like on the camera. But this is my little Cherokee flute. And, um, you know, you just, uh, <laughs> you got to make sure that's covered. Well, that's weird. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, 
Yeah, but you just you just let sound come out. It doesn't have to be beautiful. It doesn't have to be pretty. And it's okay if you hit some flat notes or whatever, because that's not what it's about. It's about making yourself happy, bringing joy into your life, and expressing with your wind, expressing with your palms on the drums, expressing with your heart, expressing with your consciousness. I am part of life. I am part of this creation. We're taught that Genesis 1-1 doesn't actually say in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. What it actually says is that in the beginning of God's creation of the heavens and the earth. Creation is not something that happened 5,778 years ago or however you want to calculate it. Salvation, uh, creation is an ongoing process. When you woke up this morning, Hashem recreated you. He took your body and breathed the soul back into you. Brought you back to life. A lot of this stuff is metaphorical language. But God is always creating. Creation is constant. We are part of that creation. We are part of nature. We're not something apart from it, no matter how hard we try. If you watch the TV show, I guess you're not supposed to watch TV. Well, I'm sorry. I like, I like, I like to watch TV sometimes. If you watch uh, The Big Bang Theory, um, there's a wonderful scene where Penny, I think it is, is telling Sheldon, who is the main nerd on the show, that he needs to get out of the house for a while. And Sheldon says, humanity has spent so many thousands of years trying to figure out how to be indoors and away from the outdoors. Why should I want to go outdoors? <laughs> you want to go outdoors because we're part of nature. And if we can align ourselves with being part of nature, how wonderful is that? Hit by to do traditionally has been done in nature. You leave your house. You go into the park. You go into the forest. My Thursday broadcast, we're reading a book called In Forest Fields by Rabbi Shalom Marush. You go into the fields of the forest to do your prayers, to do your reaching up to Hashem. Um, we're part of nature. We're not something separate from it. We need to just chill. We need to let go and realize there's only Hashem. There's only Hashem. That has deep spiritual meaning. The Kabbalists get really into that, that line out of the Tanakh. But the Torah tells us there is only Hashem. Um, if we can get our consciousness around that, if we can get a handle on that fact, how much better would our lives be? Carrie says, I love Sheldon. Outdoors is grounding, especially barefoot. One of the lines that Sheldon uh, had that I really like is he said, um, I don't remember exactly now. I, just, I thought about it for a second there. But uh, never mind, I forgot it. Um, <laughs> Sheldon has some great lines. I love that show. It, there's some really good points in that. Sometimes it's a little over the top, but I, I like that show. Uh, the young Sheldon show is not as good as I had hoped. They made a show about Sheldon when he was a little kid. That's that's a good show, but it's more of a leave it to beaver kind of show. It's not what I was hoping for. But um, but find your joy. You know, back in this, I remember back in the 80s, I think it was, uh, a couple of the big cancer research clinics were doing experiments where they would bring in television sets and have the cancer patients watch the Marx Brothers or watch the Three Stooges or watch I Love Lucy episodes. Just watch silliness. And they found out that the cancer of patients began beating their cancer better because they were laughing and they were happy and they were filled with joyous thoughts and that actually helped fight the cancer that they were having. This is so very, very important. It is not the desire of God. It is not the desire of God for us to be sad for us to be miserable, for us to be afraid, for us to be concerned. God's will is that we should be joyful. Uh, we've been joined by Joseph Suzuki, uh, Anna Nidegwa, Robert Pulliam, and Mark Bodkins. Welcome. I'm glad that you are joining us. I'm going to read a little bit more in this wonderful little booklet, Have No Fear. Uh, it's by the Breslov Institute. I'm on page 20. Uh, subsection number three. The wheel of fortune is constantly turning. 
No matter how tranquil our lives may seem and how secure we may feel, no one can be certain what the next year, the next month, the next week, or even the next moment may bring. Calamity and destruction could strike at any moment, and it could unseat the most secure from among us, driving such terror into his heart that it leaves him nowhere to turn for relief. The only sure defense in life against the inevitable is to develop an internal support system. If a person trains himself to be strong and to always hold on, then he will never get broken in life. With this kind of disciplined approach and internal support mechanism, a person becomes fearless. Otherwise, a person can be driven mad by sheer worry over the future, what's going to happen in the next hour, the next week, or the next year. The choice is yours. Either live a fragile existence, always vulnerable and at risk of collapsing out of fear, or hold yourself tight and strong, never letting anything break you. But truth to tell, how does one acquire the inner strength and resolve not to get broken in life? After all, we really don't know what the future has in store for any of us. The answer, again, is that a person must draw his inspiration from the true Sadiq. Carrie Hollis says, I wasn't aware that it could correlate with the Torah, though. Absolutely. Uh, Carol says she's got to leave. Uh, she's been sitting for a long time. God bless you, Carol. I hope you get feeling better. Our prayers are with you. Continuing, the true Sadiq provides us with a base of support encouragement and optimism in overcoming life's challenges and ordeals by penetrating the mystery of God's absolute control. To literally overcome the harshest trials and tribulations in your life, it is vital that you associate yourself with a true sadic. That teaches us the source of fear. As the sages say at Bamabar Rabbah chapter 11, 3, all while a person refrains from sinning, he is feared. And his presence is intimidating, and the creatures are afraid of him. Once he sins, however, he becomes frightened and afraid, and scared of others. So the minute a person crosses the threshold of sin, fear enters his heart, and he becomes intimidated by others. As it's written in the Zohar, there is a person that cries and knows not from what from the sins he committed unknowingly. We all commit sins on a daily basis that we're, not, that we're not even aware of as such, such as evil gossip. It is human nature to speak negatively about others without even realizing we're doing it or realizing the seriousness of the offense. We usually call this Lashon Hara in Hebrew. Furthermore, a person is completely unaware that by his actions... He is denying God and concealing his presence, God forbid. Because if you truly believe in God, and if you remain consciously aware of God at all times, you remain consciously aware of God's presence all around you, you would never have to think negative about anybody else. Because as the sages says at Erechim 15b, a person does not speak about another person without denying the divine presence. If you honestly believed that God is by your side, you would never speak insultingly about another person, because by doing so, you will be chasing away, so to speak, the divine presence. As the sages say, whoever speaks slander, the Holy One, blessed be he, says, he and I cannot dwell together in this world. Is it any wonder that we are still languishing in this long and protracted exile? The urge and the tendency to speak bad about another person is so compelling that it defies logic and reason. After all, what did that other person do to deserve such treatment, really? Consequently, we are now, as a nation, so thoroughly divided in heart and in mind, plagued by prejudice and discrimination, where one type of Jew is pinned against the other type of Jew for no good reason, lacking the strength 
that can only be found in unity, our fractured nation cowers before world opinion. We're talking about the Jewish nation here. Frighteningly insecure and shamefully dependent upon others. The only way to recover our national pride and dignity and to never be afraid again is by learning to love each other. If we stand united, nothing can vanquish us. On the contrary, the nations of the world would fear us. But since this is not so, we continue to suffer. As the sages say at Midrash Agadah, evil slander is as severe as javelins and swords that mortally wound. A person who possesses arms must be very careful. These are not toys to be fooled around with, for they can be deadly. Do not excuse your actions by saying, I was merely taking a pot shot, or I was just playing around with a knife. No, if you own a bow and an arrow, and if you shoot recklessly, you could kill another person. A person's tongue is likened to a weapon. It's like a javelin. It's a bullet. It's a sword. And whenever it spews forth slander, it can assassinate another person. This colossal sin of Lashon Hara is so rampant and widespread today that it has become a systematic problem. And almost as if by metaphor, so has the rise in incidences of the most dreaded disease, cancer. Daily we are confronted by frightening reports of those who have succumbed to this prevalent disease. And what is the nature of this disease? It eats away at a person from every point of view, every point of entry. And yet no one gives it a second thought as to why it actually occurs. It occurs because of Lashon Hara, of evil gossip, of evil speech. As the sages say at Erechim 15b, Whoever speaks slander, his sins are elevated to the level of idol worship, immorality, and murder, which are the three cardinal sins. Despite the fact that the sages inform us that slander is the gravest offense, is, graver, is a graver offense than most of the other serious sins, yet we persist in committing this most despicable crime. Every day, we instigate arguments between each other, and if that's not enough, whole cities, towns, and hamlets have become divided and polarized by the strife provoked by this type of behavior. Adding insult to injury, the media provides an open forum to perpetrate the gossip and the lies even further by filling its pages and screens with slander and libelous reports. So contemptible is gossip that the sages commented, Whoever speaks slander says to the Holy One, blessed be he, he and I cannot dwell together in this world. The scope of seriousness of this offense cannot be emphasized enough. Why is our society seized with so much fear and terror? If for no other reason except that we have alienated ourselves from God by speaking against our fellow man. Furthermore, Rabbi Nachman said at Sefer Hamidos chap, uh, on Slander 15, whoever libels his friend, there is no pardon for him. Now don't take that too literally. We can always receive Hashem's pardon and forgiveness. But so many of us are troubled today and we are looking for answers. And yet we haven't put two and two together yet. Because gossiping has become second nature to us. So loneliness and isolation will continue to pursue our callous generation that cannot find relief for all that ails them, including the ominous threat of cancer. Because of their failure to make the connection between treachery and their mouths and its devastating consequences. So admit it, we all need God's help today. We need to get relief by coming back to God. So why not start making amends for all the hurtful remarks and statements that you made against your fellow man, which drove you away from God 
in the first place. We've got 20 minutes left. I'm going to go ahead and keep reading. I think we can finish this little booklet today. It's a great little booklet. You can get it from the Brezhnev Research Institute. Peace and fear are opposite sides of the same coin. There is nothing more precious than when Jews dwell together in peace and harmony, the sages said, Utzin chapter 3. God could not find a more worthy vessel to contain blessings for Israel than peace. Shalom. And who are the champions of peace? In every generation, God sends us the Sadakim, as we discussed earlier, and Torah scholars who foster harmony and peace among the Jewish people. As the sages said at Barakot 64a, Torah scholars increase peace throughout the world. I want to remind something of here. Our rabbis, including the Chafetz Chaim, are very clear that the reason that Hashem had the second temple destroyed in 78 CE, the reason, was because of Lashon Hara and Jewish infighting. That's how important this sin is. And today, we are guilty of doing the same thing, and yet we're praying for the coming of Mashiach and the third temple while we're doing the same things that caused the second temple to be destroyed. Continuing. Torah scholars increase peace throughout the world. Granted, we are a media-driven society whose opinions are based on what's printed in the newspapers or what's seen on the television. And yet, have you ever thought of seeking guidance from a Torah scholar? Think about it for a moment. From where is your unique status as a Jew derived? And this would apply to Noahides as well, if not from the Torah. And is it not the Torah that originally defined the Jews as a nation? So why look somewhere else? Indeed, our generation, like those that preceded us, and perhaps even more those even, perhaps even more so, must contend with the sinister dark forces that always seem to vanquish the light and obscure the presence of God. Today, the movement for nationalism with its secular moralistic values seeks to uproot the pinions of faith in God and His Torah, which are the, back, which are the bedrock of our people. Preying on our insecurity as an isolated entity, they drain us of all hope and confidence in our strength as a godly nation. Again, we're talking about the nation of Israel, but the same applies to America and other countries. Driving us into submission by means of intimidation. No, we must fight back. We must wake up to who we are as a people and where our strength truly lies. Torah. Sadness must be replaced with joy. Fear must be supplanted by faith. Optimism must chase away hopelessness and despair. And then peace will reign. The time has come for the Jewish people to join hands in seeking peace by unifying and by realizing that we must no longer be afraid. Peace is so vital that the sages were prompted to declare at Tanchoma Shofatim 18, See how great is the power of shalom, that even toward your enemies did God say you should make overtures of peace. Can there be a greater enemy than one who attempts to deprive you of your religion and your faith in God? Our generation bears witness to perhaps one of the most tragic spiritual holocausts ever, where more than a million Jews have been persuaded to forsake the heritage of their forefathers by the enemies of God who have no shame in speaking openly against him. Nevertheless, even to those adversaries of God who have mounted an assault against the Jewish soul that our sages urge you must extend an olive branch of peace because peace is synonymous with God's name. Shabbos 10b. Furthermore, our sages said, Great is peace, because the name of the Holy One, 
Blessed be he, is called Shalom. Vayikara Raba 9.9 Therefore, stop running to make peace with the other nations, which is just an excuse and exercise of futility, and it's never going to happen anyway. Why live in denial and fool yourself? Just look at the pages of history over the course of the last 2,000 years. They're dripping with Jewish blood, mercilessly shed by the children of Esau and Yishmael. 1,000 years devoted by one and a half thousand years devoted by another to the wholesale slaughter of violent atrocities per perpetrated against our people in the most horrific and gruesome ways imaginable. And if that is not shocking enough for you, they have the audacity to pressure us into signing peace treaties, as if by one stroke of a pen on a flimsy piece of paper, centuries of pain and trauma could be instantly erased and forgotten. This poor excuse for a goodwill gesture holds no water, especially since it's just a cover-up for their real intention, which is to drive us into the sea. Come to your senses already. Stop fantasizing about fictitious peace accords. Expend your energies instead on reconciling your life with that of your fellow Jew and fostering unity between the Jewish people. Stop looking for faults in your Jewish brethren and start casting each other in a favorable light. As Rabbi Nachman said at Likate Maharan 1282, even a wicked person must be judged favorably. This method of fostering goodwill between us has the power to inspire your fellow Jew to have a change of heart and perhaps to return to God, which is the true function of peace. In fact, in our troubled times, this must be our primary agenda, underlining all of our efforts at bringing about the redemption, pulling ourselves closer together in order to make a final and complete reconciliation with our Father in heaven. So, make up with your wife. Be kinder and more patient towards your children. Demonstrate more tolerance towards your relatives. Forgive your neighbors and your friends. This is the repair work that will restore unity to the people and that will pave the way for the redemption. This is the way of genuine peace. Be on the lookout, however, for the corruptive forces that in every generation subtly seek to invade peaceful societies, fanning the flames of controversy to satisfy their own greed, employing the art of divide and conquer. These criminals have been responsible throughout the ages for instigating fights, conflicts, and feuds between individuals, towns, cities, and even nations to distract the masses while they secretly steal and exploit from them all that they are worth. Masters of deception, these smooth operators, are the real enemies of peace. They have destroyed families, ruined reputations, and wasted whole towns and villages, all the while hiding behind a smokescreen of strife and chaos that they contrived to delude detection. In time, the truth surfaces and their wickedness becomes exposed, but by that time, the damage has already been done. Friends, do not be duped. Resist the temptation to engage in, quote, the good fight, and do not let anyone convince you to take sides in an argument, no matter how justified the cause. Your task is to repair the breaches in the bastion of peace, wherever you can find them. Immediately do that now. Show your fellow Jew that you love him by revealing God to him, and you will be one step closer to bringing about the redemption. As the sages say at Davarim Rabbah chapter 512, great is peace that the Holy, great is peace that the Holy One, blessed be he, will not announce to Israel that they are redeemed. 
only through peace. The sun is rising. You opening your eyes to the dawn of a new day. Automatically, you begin to feel the butterflies fluttering in your stomach as waves of fear begins crossing over the threshold of your mind. Stop right there. Now, try using the techniques outlined above in this booklet to cover your fears. Remind yourself who the captain of your ship is. Regain a sense of control by working on your faith in God's control. Perform mitzvah, any mitzvah, but do it with all the joy that you can muster and take pride in the privilege of being able to connect to God by doing His will. Then, give yourself a pep talk to hold on strong and tight no matter how difficult the challenges of that day become. Promise yourself that you will not let anything break you. This pep talk, by the way, is what we were talking about with humming a little ditty and that type thing. Finally, find a way to show goodwill to your fellow Jews and spread this good feeling all around. Your fellow Jew will then feel good, and so will you. Your fellow Noahide will feel good, and so will you. Your neighbor, your wife, your friends, your co-workers will feel good, and so will you. And better yet, you will have no fear any longer. So, that is the entire little booklet. It's a small booklet, but it has tremendous uh, information in it. We want shalom as a people. We want shalom, peace as individuals. We want to still our heart and know that Hashem is God, that Hashem is in control. The secret to doing that is attaching to a sadik and avoiding those people who are the opposite. Attaching yourself to righteousness, attaching yourself to learning Torah, attaching yourself to personal prayer, hit bodudut, attaching yourself to singing songs of joy and happiness, life and love, attaching yourself to acts of charity, acts of loving kindness, to intentionally doing tikkun within your own life, reparations within your own life, and with the life of those around you. This will bring inner peace. And your inner peace will leak out and others will experience. Just as you will benefit by being in the presence of a sadik, others will be benefiting by being in your presence. Because you are now bringing forth light rather than darkness. And you will have no fear. If you have any questions, comments, or thoughts on anything that we discussed today, before we conclude. Uh, it's sort of wide open, so um, we can discuss anything that you might have. Any questions, any thoughts, any comments, any concerns, any doubts, and so on. If uh, Veronica, if you're still here, I would like to invite you to um, put the link in for the... Um, for the newsletter and for that type of a thing. Uh, Veronica is doing us a wonderful service by organizing a Noahide newsletter um, that I'm writing in and we'll have other people writing in as well. Um, various information about what it means to be a Noahide, but more than that, what it means to attach yourself to God, the joy and the peace. Uh, Carrie says she really needed this today. Thank you. Well, thank you. I, I really do appreciate that. And I, honestly, I needed to hear it too because, like I said at the outset, Donald and I both have not been having uh, the happy day that we would both like to have. My, I actually, my day actually wasn't that bad. I just, I have a lot on my mind and that I wasn't sort of giving over to Hashem, that I'm sort of owning some of this stuff. And that's not good for me. So I needed to, I needed to get this off my chest as well. Thank you, Veronica. Uh, so Veronica Port is doing this wonderful newsletter. Uh, you'll see it in the chat screen. You can click it. You do not have to be a Noahide to sign up. 
Everybody is welcome. The focus of the newsletter is the Noahide laws, but it's more than that because it is how anybody can attach themselves to Hashem. And Veronica, if you'll also point, uh, share the, uh, you just did, um, if you'd like to make a submission, a testimonial, uh, anything like that, Veronica just put up the email address. If you are a Noahide, Veronica would very, because Veronica is our editor, this really is her thing. Um, Veronica would really like you to share a testimony. If you're a Noahide, how did you become a Noahide? What led you to that? What made you think that? If you're not a Noahide, but you're leaning in that direction, share. Let us know what's on your heart. If you have any questions that you would like us to address either here online or in the newsletter, you can submit those and Veronica will make sure that I get those and we can uh, we can answer your questions. Um, we also mentioned that we were going to do a thing last night, a private get together on Hangouts. Um, <clears throat> we had some unexpected problems and I had double scheduled, which just I'm just too busy, honestly, but I didn't realize it at the time. So we're going to reschedule this thing for Sunday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern time zone. Um, what this is going to be, this is going to be a private conversation on Google Hangouts offline. It will not be broadcast anywhere. And we're doing that because we want people to really feel that they can be open. Um, there's certain things that Noah Hyde's understandably don't want their families or their friends or their associates to hear them say questions doubts things that they're wondering about so this is going to be a closed in group to discuss this we had to cancel it last night at the last minute we posted to the noahide group that we were doing that i hope we didn't mess anybody up here's what veronica needs for this to happen veronica needs your email address okay if you would like to join this group we promise you we do not ever sell emails we don't spam etc but we need the email address that you use to sign up with Google Hangouts. If you have not yet signed up with Google Hangouts, go there, sign up. They'll want an email address. Send that email address to Veronica at Noahide Newsletter at ProtonMail.com. It's on the screen. Veronica will then send you an invitation, and she'll also send me a copy of these, and I'll send you an invitation both, except both of our invitations, if you would. This invitation simply says that we can talk to you on Hangouts. Then, when it's time for these broadcasts, one of us, and that's why I want both of us, because that way if I can't make it, she can, or she can't, maybe I can. One of us will send you an invitation to these, on, to, not online, but to these live discussions. But first, we need an email address from you to send you an invitation to connect with you. Then... When it's time, which will be Sundays at 8 p.m., we will send you an invitation a few minutes before 8 p.m. East Coast, Eastern Time, to join us. So it's a two-step thing. You need to sign up with Google Hangouts, send Veronica the email address that you use to do that. She will send you an invitation. I will send you an invitation. Accept our invitations. Then we will send you an invitation to join the group when it's ready. Um, Veronica says, Carrie Ann, did you mean you sent a message to Slomo or Proton? Um, oh, I see. Carrie says, I sent you a message to ask a question on reading. Okay, yeah. If you send me a message, I will answer those as soon as I can. Uh, I can't always respond immediately, but I, I, I really try to get back as quickly as I can. Because I get a lot of messages. <laughs> I mean, I get a lot of messages. Um, but if you want to join this group, you need to send it to the email address, Noah Hyde Newsletter at Proton. Don't send that to me because I've, I've got enough. <laughs> okay. Send your email address to Veronica. Say, I'd like to be part of these Noah Hyde discussions. You're not committing yourself to come all the time or whatever. You just want to have the option to come in. Send Veronica your email address. She will send me your email address. Then both of us will invite you. If you have a question, you can either send it to the Noah Hyde newsletter or you can just PM it to me personally. That's okay, too. I answer questions as quickly as I can. Um, the newsletter, we're going to be coming out with the third edition on the first. So we're still new there. So we're still sort of feeling our way around on what the newsletter is going to become. But we need you to send us your email address so we can invite you to join us on Hangout. Then 
we can use your email address to invite you to the particular session. It's a two-step thing. We cannot invite you to our Google Hangout discussion until you have accepted the invitation to join us on Hangouts. Donald was really good at explaining this. He's not here, but I think, I think we've got that covered, though. It's a dual process. So we need your email address, plus we need you to specifically say, I want to join you on Hangouts. I don't care the wording, but that's what you're wanting because we're not going to spam anybody. Then we'll send you an invitation to join us on Hangouts. You have to approve that. Then we can add you. And that will be Sundays at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, Bezer Hashem. Um, let's see. Veronica, there's that. Okay, so Carrie says, I sent you a message to ask a question on a reading I saw today. If you could let me know your thoughts, I'd appreciate it. I'd be more than happy to do that. Did you PM it to me or did you email it to me? Um, but I will answer that as soon as I'm able to. Um, and Carrie says to the Rebbe. Uh, I'm not quite sure what that means. If you send it to my Rebbe, if you send it to me, if you send it by email or PM, in either case, if it's to me, I'll get it. Um, and I will respond as quickly as I'm able to. Carrie says anytime you have is great. Thank you. Um, Veronica says, any suggestions on how to improve the newsletter will also be greatly appreciated. Absolutely. Also, the newsletter, uh, the way Veronica is doing it uh, so far, has always had at least one snippet about news in Israel. Um, we're open to submissions about news in Israel, but we're not going to be repeating all the news that you're hearing constantly. But if there's major things that happen either regarding Israel, for instance, hopefully in May, the U.S. Embassy will be set up in Jerusalem. Yay. Or if there's something else that you think is particularly important, or let's say the Knesset makes some kind of a ruling on um, Noahide status or whatever, those are totally wonderful things for the newsletter. Feel free to submit those. We cannot guarantee that everything you submit will necessarily be included, but we encourage your submissions, and we will uh, determine from what we get what we're able to put out in the newsletter. Uh, Carrie says, in a messenger, oh, no, I sent it to you. All right, don't worry about it, Carrie. If you send it to me, I'll get it. If you send it to Rabbi, he'll get it. But you'll get a response as soon as we can, anyhow. Um, the best way to reach me usually is by PMing me personally at Facebook if you have a question. You can do it by my email, but I get so much email, and I don't check it as often as I should. The best way to get me is by PMing me on Facebook. Those I check pretty much throughout the day constantly whenever they come in. Um, if I'm online, which I very often am, too often. <laughs> am. All righty. Any other questions or comments before we close for today? Um, again, I do want to thank you all. Um, today is Wednesday. I was thinking it was Tuesday. That was my bad. Uh, today is Wednesday. So tomorrow at 12 noon, as usual, we will be having Learning a Moon with Shlomo. Uh, we're going to be going back into our book. Um, in Forest Fields by Rabbi Shalom Arush tomorrow. And then tomorrow evening at 8 p.m., we will be having the next uh, Noahide discussion. You have to be a member of the One God, Seven Laws group to take part in that. That is the only one of my four weekly broadcasts that are not on my wall. So you have to sign up there. Also, a couple of days ago, I did an update on um, a piece on Isaiah 7 3 or 7 14, 7 14. And in the comments, people asked me to do, uh, to redo my, uh, to, to repost my study on the self suffering servant, which is Isaiah 52 to 54. I'm working on that now. Um, those posts I post basically when I have the time. So if you are following me, if, you're, if we're friends on Facebook and you follow me, if you're online when I do these, you should see a, you should get a pop up saying Shlomo is now live. That's the best way to do that. Those of you who are like me online a lot, and I know several of you are. Uh, these broadcasts I do basically when I have a chance, um, at the request of people that I accept their authority. I have pulled all of my what might be called counter missionary material from my website. Uh, I am redoing some of that material strictly as Jewish studies. That's what I did with the with the Isaiah 7 one. Um, I'm going to be working on 
doing the same thing with my Isaiah 52 to 54 piece uh, called Who is the Suffering Servant? That piece is not going to require a whole lot of work. So I may even do that one later today. I'm not sure I'll make it today. But I will be posting that as soon as I can. Again, the best way to see those live is to have me as your friend, and then you'll get the notice when I go live. Um, otherwise, they're always on my website, on my Facebook page where I do the live broadcast, and also on my YouTube, so you can watch them later on. And if you follow me on Twitter, you also get a notification uh, whenever I do a YouTube video that I've done that one. All right, I think that's it. And then, of course, join us next Sunday as Ahuva and I will be continue with, continuing with Reb uh, Shlomo Rush's wonderful book, The Garden of Imuna. I um, want to thank you all again for, uh, for joining here. We had a pretty good turnout today. We had the meter got as high as 18 at one point. Um, we, I think we got quite a few people here. That counter on here, I know for a fact, is not accurate. So that doesn't actually tell me. But uh, do share these studies and these broadcasts with people. Uh, Donald often will uh, encourage you to do that when we're first coming on. But share these with other people. Let people know we're doing it. I think we're getting out some good information. Um, oh, also, uh, tomorrow night, Thursday night, the 8th of March, which I'm just saying that in case I was watching the video, but uh, tomorrow night, we're also going to have a very special One God, Seven Laws. Um, last Sunday, I did an interview with, um, with Moshe, Moshe, with Moshe, Moshe uh, Shulman, who is um, uh, who is an incredibly important modern-day, a lot living Torah scholar. Um, you all perhaps remember when there was the issue that came up with some of the Noahides going off track and a formal letter was sent out by the Jewish rabbinate criticizing a couple of these rabbis for their Noahide activities. Um, Moshe Shulman is one of the people who actually was a signature to those notifications. So that's how important this guy is. He's a big deal. Uh, we had a wonderful time next sun last Sunday. So we're going to do a special one tomorrow night in the Noahide group. He is not. He's going to join us at nine o'clock. The group starts at eight, so we're going to do Herman Wook's "This Is My God" for probably forty minutes or so. Then we'll chat for a few minutes, and then at nine o'clock, roughly, Moshe should be joining us um, for that. And so then we'll have at least an hour with him uh, tomorrow night again. So those of you who enjoyed him on Sunday or who know of him, and a lot of you do, or a lot of you are his friends online. We'll enjoy that broadcast, I'm pretty sure. That'll be tomorrow at 8 p.m., but join us at, or at 9 p.m., but join us at 8 for the first half of the show. Okay, I think we got all that out. Um, and again, just in closing, um, there's an awful lot of uncertainty in the world today. We all see it. There's a lot of infighting and there's a lot of nonsense. Just keep your eyes on God doesn't matter. Just keep your eyes on Hashem, whether you're Jewish or Noahide, or you're of another religion and you have an idea of who you believe God is. God looks at your heart. God is merciful and God looks at your heart. Keep your eyes on God according to your understanding, always seeking to understand Him better, and don't fear. Because if you truly believe that He is in charge of your life, you got nothing to be afraid of. You got no reason for depression or sadness. Um, I'm going to close today with a different song. I usually close with a full version of the song that we started with, but uh, I was running late, so frankly I grabbed a song at random for the first part. Uh, but I'm going to close with a song by my friends, The Brills. Um, and this particular song, I think, is really applicable to this one. It's in English, and it encourages us all, take a look around. There are mitzvahs to be done everywhere. Just open your eyes and see what Hashem has for you. You will be amazed. So thank you for watching. Till next time, may God bless you, keep you, and cause his face to shine upon you. Take a look around.
Open up your eyes, see the beauty around you, and open up your ears and hear nature calling you, and open up your heart and feel the love He has for you, and open up your hand and give to the one who needs you. We got so. To do, the day is here for you. We got needs for us to do. That's all we got to do. And if you're feeling down, don't be alarmed. Just look to the one above and ask him for his love. For the secret to success. Strong, knowing deep down inside that you're not at all alone. Open up your mind and imbue it with infinite wisdom. Open up your spirit and catch its inspiration, and open up your soul to its spiritual liberation, and open up yourself to the way you should be living. We got so much to do. The day is here for you. We got. That's all we got to do. And if you're feeling good, don't change your mood. Just look to the one above. Thank you for His love. For the secret to success is being very strong and knowing deep down inside He's helped you all. friends for watching <clears throat> um, uh, typing something here for the uh, for uh, Carrie <clears throat> all right uh, thank you for watching again and uh, until next time be well I hope to see you tomorrow God bless you <laughs>